Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Isabel Kaplan, author of the new novel, NSFW. Bookless wrote about NSFW. Kaplan peels back the curtain to examine the culture of a television network in the sharply observed, completely absorbing debut novel. Kaplan's authentic insider knowledge makes her piercing first outing a cut above the plethora of Hollywood set novels. Isabel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your novel NSFW, how would you describe the novel? Uh, NSFW is a darkly comedic coming of age story about trying to succeed in Hollywood without selling your soul. And it follows, uh, the narrator is a recent college graduate who has just moved back to her hometown of Los Angeles, with which she has a very complicated love-hate relationship and is embarking on a career in television. And she grew up in the shadow of Hollywood, uh, the daughter of a prominent feminist attorney, and she knew much more about implicit bias than box offices. But she has hopes of breaking into the system and changing it from the inside. And the novel follows her as she starts work as a temp at a broadcast network and climbs the ranks there and learns how to play the game. And over time, she discovers the difficulty of playing a part without becoming it. And she struggles to negotiate her boss's demands, her mother's demands, and to meet her own needs. And ultimately, her professional and personal lives come crashing together and she has to decide what to protect, her career, her values, her mother, her coworkers. And it's um, it's a complicated moral quandary. And do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write NSFW? Yeah. So I started writing it in the beginning of 2017. And I was in my first year of graduate school in an MFA program. And I had just left um, a few months earlier uh, working in Hollywood. I spent my early 20s working at a network. And in the beginning of 2017, I, like so many people, were full of distress and despair and was starting to question my own, my faith, sorry, my, my faith in institutions and in the possibility of systemic change from the inside and also really questioning in a serious way uh, my own complicity in systems that I had been raised to believe that I was fighting. And all of those, all of those thoughts and concerns really fueled my investigation. I wanted to explore like the gray areas of complicity and empowerment. And, um, and I started writing it before the Me Too movement launched, but finished it after, you know, the, um, that was well underway. And, I was really interested in exploring less the cases of the absolute worst offenses and more all of the systems that are in place that have enabled so much of, you know, awfulness in, um, in the entertainment industry. Sure. And I'm curious, what was your initial, <coughs> excuse me, what was your initial writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? So I started writing when I was really, really young, and I was um, very fortunate and deluded to believe that, you know, if I just finished a book, I could publish it. And I I tried to sell my first book when I was 12. I you know vividly remember going to Barnes & Noble and sitting on the floor with a literary agent's guide and making notes of who I thought would be right and querying <laughs> agents. And, um, and I got a surprising number of responses, I think. You know, they weren't getting that many queries from 12-year-olds, did not sell that book, which is great because it wasn't good. Uh, But then um, I, so I then sold a young adult novel when I was 16. And at that point I felt like, you know, I'd been at it for years, but of course, and I I guess I had, it been four, but I was 16 (laughs) and I had no idea what I was doing. I was just very ambitious and hopeful. Um, And that novel came out when I had just turned 19, the summer after my freshman year of college. And at first I thought, you know, I've got to write another book really fast before I've lost the moment, before my youth is no longer a commodity. I have to do it quickly. But I was very, I was fortunate to to have wonderful early writing professors who encouraged me to take time to figure out what I wanted to write next, that if I was really in this for the long haul, that I should treat it that way, that it wasn't a sprint. And that was 
incredibly helpful for me. And it allowed me to spend time learning and reading and thinking and not push myself just to write a book for the sake of writing the next book. And, um, and it then took me, you know, a lot longer than I thought it would. Obviously there was college to do work, career, um, pursuits. And I, I was working on another book that I then didn't end up finishing. And that's what I started graduate school with. And I, uh, once I started on this in 2017, it really, it felt immediately clear that this was the book I wanted to write at that moment. Well, you mentioned your MFA, and I think you went to NYU. What was your I MFA did. experience like? It was wonderful. It was really great. I can't say enough wonderful things about the community there. Um, it's, I mean, it was a really a privilege to spend those years surrounded by people who cared about writing in such an intense and passionate and genuine way. And I, I felt supported. And I think that I've always been incredibly deadline driven. And it was really wonderful and helpful to be able to prioritize working on this book and know that I had this limited time with these wonderful people to have such incredible readers and to try and make the most of it and, you know, come up with as many pages as I could in that time. That's great. Well, you you talked about the themes and and uh, that that uh, the novel addresses and and the the um, issues the systemic issues in Hollywood. I'm curious from your own experience in Hollywood, and obviously I'm sure that you have followed many of the um, uh, many of the controversies in the last several years, uh, um, Weinstein and then Scott Rudin, et cetera. I'm curious what 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 do you think uh, it will take for change to happen in Hollywood in the entertainment industry? It's a very good question. I think people like to say that change has happened, and they like to point out things like the dethroning of Weinstein and Rudin and Les Moonves and others as examples of change. I think, unfortunately, those are you know it's it's great that those men have been outed, but there's so much more to do. And I think the harder issues to address are the much more subtle biases and subtle difficulties. And it's in a weird way easier right now to assess and address what to do if your boss gropes you than it is to figure out what to do if you just feel subtly demeaned a lot of the time in ways that you can't put your finger on but involve discomfort. And I think the difference between five years ago and now is that now everyone knows that things like microaggressions are bad, but I don't think some of the people who are still engaging them in them have any idea they're doing it. They think they're bad and it, you know they shouldn't do it. And I think in order to get to a point of change, it involves, we really need to be having a more open and thoughtful and nuanced dialogue instead of lip service and announcements of initiatives for inclusion and diversity and, you know, an initiative is all well and good, but if the people in power are still doing things that are problematic, even in a more quiet way, it perpetuates these problems. And I think recently, you know, some agencies and other places have been raising, increasing the um, starting salaries of their assistant position, which is incredibly necessary and way overdue. And there needs to be <clears throat> much more of that to make these career paths accessible to people who don't already have contacts in the industry and then familial support that can help them until they start making a salary they can support themselves on. Sure. Well, I know that you co-founded an, or an organization, Project 100, after the 2016 election. What's the goal of Project 100? Yes. So Project 100, which has um, since folded, but we, um, we started with the goal of 100 progressive women in Congress by the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, which is, was 2020. And uh, we thought it would take two election cycles and a hundred felt to be very honest, like not really a high enough goal. But when we were starting to meet with strategists and all sorts of people, they, we were told that that was too high a goal, that we should be more <laughs> modest at first. And our goal with that was to, there were so many women after the 2016 election who were interested in running for office, but didn't have political backgrounds, came from, you know, medicine or education or were veterans or did all sorts of really interesting things and understood their communities really well, but didn't have access to the, to the pa like the power players and fundraising and all of the horrible things that we need to get out of politics, but are currently still entrenched in the system. And our hope 
was to help create a platform that would give those women access to attention and to funding and to press. And so we we created was the first and only searchable database of all progressive women running for Congress. And so you could filter by, if you wanted to search for a woman of color who was an educator in the Midwest, you could search that way and find her profile and figure out how to support her. And it was a really exciting project to be a part of. We actually, um, we hit 100 in 2018, you know, America did, which was incredibly exciting and much faster than we thought it would happen. Um, and the organization has since um, since closed, but I'm still very close with my co-founders. And it was a really, a really important thing to have done with that time because I was working on writing. I was in my MFA program and so what? much of that can feel so interior and you're in your head so much. And it's a lot of thinking about your own thoughts and feelings. And it was important to me to have something that I was working on that allowed me to engage externally with the world and to feel like I was doing something concrete and engaged with others and community. Sure. So what was your writing process when you were working on NSFW? Did you outline the novel before you started writing or did you just jump into the narrative? I did not outline. I have forever dreams of becoming someone who is capable of outlining <laughs> um, before I write. I I actually wrote um, the whole draft of NSFW longhand, uh, which was not something I'd ever done before. And at first it started as sort of a way of tricking myself. I can be very controlling about language and, you know, very hyper-focused on not writing a sentence unless the sentence is perfect. And writing by hand was really helpful for tricking myself into not worrying about that at the beginning, because I knew that I would have to type it up anyway. So there would be time to revise and rewrite. And because of telling myself that I actually ended up, you know, with more usable sentences than not, because I had sort of released that pressure valve on myself. And I, for the first, you know, six months of writing it, set myself a pretty strict daily regimen of, I think it was like five longhand pages a day, six days a week. And I pushed through like that. And I, that is not the most efficient way to, you know, if you want to limit the number of extra pages you're going to write, I would not recommend that, but it was very helpful for me for amassing material. And then after that, I went back and at first the book was it had a much longer time scope. It covered, you know, it took place in more places. There was a little more narrative, formal experimentalism to it. And ultimately, in the end, I really trimmed it, compressed it. It ended up in a very pretty tight time frame. But for the revisions, I actually put post-its of each of the scenes out on my wall. And that was very helpful for visualizing, very helpful for visualizing pacing and structure and whether I was letting certain narrative threads dropped. And I got very into that with color coding based on, you know, subject and characters. And that was helpful for restructuring things. Hey, this is Jeff, host of the podcast. You know, sometimes it seems like there's just an infinite amount of information out there. And that's exactly why I love Wondrium. Wondrium is a streaming platform that offers thousands of programs and documentaries from respected experts who really know their stuff. And for the listeners of this podcast, Wondrium has a wide selection of writing resources, how to write best-selling fiction, how to publish your book, writing creative nonfiction, every day is a poem, how to create comics, and much, much more. And the best part, you can watch or listen anytime, anywhere with the Wondrium app. Download and watch or listen on the go. Explore all of your wonders with Wondrium and your brain will love it. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash B-O-O-K-S. Again, sign up today at wondrium.com slash books to get unlimited access with a 14-day free trial. Give it a try. That's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Um, I mean, the, I, I'm a big believer in Anne Lamott's shitty first draft advice. I think <laughs> uh, it's so important 
to get it written, that you can't get it right until you've written it. And that not finishing because you're not sure where it's going is a really good way of ensuring you'll never finish. And that you can, you can, as long as you can see the next scene, you can see the next scene after that. And to not worry if you can't see where you're going yet, that it is possible to write yourself there. And, and don't worry about whether you're wasting time thinking about things, the time that time spent will add up to something. And then otherwise just read a lot. Every, anytime I'm feeling sort of depleted or stuck in a rut or like I'm not doing something interesting, it's probably because I haven't been reading widely enough. And I try to read all different kinds of fiction just to keep, keep my brain open in a useful way. And then the, the other best advice is to find writers you trust who are good readers. And I know that can be very hard, um, but it's so important and so helpful because so much of this is an internal private process where you're engaged in an endless conversation with yourself. And if you're anything like me, it involves a lot of thought spiraling where you, you know, <laughs> ricochet from extreme self-confidence to extreme despair. And it can be very helpful to have people who are outside of you and centering you and, and are honest. And it's, you know, are not just going to say everything you do is great, but if you do something that, you know, that they want to flag or they think that their narrative distance from it can be very helpful and very supportive throughout the journey because from, you know, from writing a first draft to publication is an incredibly long process full of all sorts of different frustrations, despair, moments of anxiety, and it's helpful to have people in your corner. Well, are you working on a new novel now? I am. I am about 100 pages into my next novel, and it still feels very early. I'm trying to be better about outlining this time and we'll see, we'll see how well that works. And are, are you uh, handwriting it again? Not consistently. I, <clears throat> I'll handwrite various chapters and scenes, but I have not, the first time it was really like, I, you know, I have the three notebooks and I stuck to the three notebooks. This time it's been a little more haphazard of, you know, I'll write out various scenes and anytime I'm stuck, I go back to a notebook that, you know, that's the the trick for me. Got it. Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? I have been reading a lot of debut novels recently. I've, um, over the course of the pandemic, uh, become connected with a number of debut and sophomore novelists, and it's been an incredible community. And I'm, you know, I'm excited to support as many of them as I can. Uh, right now I'm reading Disorientation by Elaine Shea Chow, uh, who was also in my MFA program at NYU as was Caitlin Barish, whose novel, um, A Novel Obsession, just published, and Coco Mellers, who wrote Cleopatra and Frankenstein. Um, I just finished Post Traumatic by Chantal Johnson, which is wonderful and biting and sharp, um, and also really loved The Portrait of a Mirror by A. Natasha Dukovsky and The Shimmering State by Meredith Westgate. So those are a few in the debut category. And then I... Um, I recently discovered Lori Colwin, who I can't believe I had never read and have been tearing through her work with great excitement. I love happy all the time and family happiness a lot. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your new novel NSFW? I am on Instagram at IZ Kaplan and Twitter at Isabel Kaplan. And then um, there's more info on the book on my fairly rudimentary website, which is just isabelkaplan.com. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking the new novel, NSFW. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Isabel, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Thanks a lot. So like I said, if you could just leave this browser window open for um, like a minute or so, it just needs. The thing about Los Angeles is that it's awful and I hate it. But when I'm there... Nowhere else exists, and I can't imagine leaving. It's a difficult place to be old or sick or fat or poor or without a strong social media presence. It's not an easy place to be young, either. After college graduation, I postponed my return from Boston by one week, then two, cat-sitting for a professor. It's the second week that drives my mother over the edge. She calls, she emails, she accuses me of loving the professor's cat more than her. 
She says, don't I know how hard she has been working, how lonely and depressed she has been, how she has been counting down the days until my return. I get sick upon arrival, aching limbs at baggage claim, blooming into a fever by the following day. Garden variety virus, but it hits my mother's sweet spot. You're run down, poor baby. I'll take care of you, she says. My father sends a welcome home text. Hope to see you for dinner soon, he writes. He doesn't ask where I'll be living or if I'd like to stay with him. I suspect he doesn't want the infringement on his space, his freedom. It's strange being back in my mother's house. She's just finished renovating, and it barely looks familiar. Though somehow items from long ago, CD players, pants from Gap Kids, have resurfaced in the new version of my old bedroom. The sight of them is unsettling. My parents divorced when I was 10, during the summer before fifth grade. They were civil, but it was terrible. My mother suggested we go on a diet together. It'll be fun, she told me. You'll look great for the start of the school year. She said she knew I had been overeating because I could tell she was unhappy in her marriage. This was news to me. She taught me all about calories and the places they hide. I dipped carrots in Dijon mustard, while my friends at day camp traded Skittles and M&Ms, candy coatings melting in a rainbow smear on their palms. My weeks were split between my parents. My father kept the house in the Hollywood Hills, and my mother moved to an apartment in Santa Monica, across the street from the beach. There was an infinity pool on the roof, and towels were provided, she called it Heartbreak Hotel. A few nights a week, I would ride my scooter to the Third Street Promenade with my mother and younger brother. While my brother browsed the toy store, I punished myself in the basement fitting rooms of Gap Kids, trying on jeans two sizes too small and watching my stomach pucker as I did up the button. I practiced sitting casually on the bench in the fitting room as if I were on a playground bench at recess. I made believe I was talking about normal things with my classmates and kept an eye on my stomach in the mirror. My mother moved several times over the next five years, a real tour du West LA, before landing back in Santa Monica, two miles east of Heartbreak Hotel. When I think back on those years, I remember a choking sensation. My father's silence, my mother's longing, my brother's rage, my bottomless hunger, my psychiatrist kept increasing dosages, switching medications. Trial and error, she said. I would stare at the tapestry behind her head and say, week after week, I want to stop falling asleep in class. The day my mother moved into this house was also the day I got drunk for the first time. Early evening, a bottle of Grey Goose on the kitchen counter, carton of orange juice next to it. I helped myself. If you drink that screwdriver, you can't drive, my mother said. I said I didn't care, and I drank that one and then another and another until the floor tilted. I was 15. I couldn't drive at night on a learner's permit anyway. My parents were both from New England, high-achieving youngest children of long-suffering Jewish immigrant mothers. A perfect match on paper. My mother moved to Los Angeles for my father, a literary historian who moved for his research, wooed by a trove of archives acquired by USC. My mother often said that my father was the only person who would willingly relinquish tenure at Harvard. It took me a long time to understand the double-edged slice of that comment. My mother never liked Los Angeles, but she also never left. She stayed for my brother and me so that our lives would be stable and we could have a close, or closer, relationship with our father. She may do with what she believed to be a pale imitation of the career she imagined having in Boston, where her star was on the rise and her expertise, as a lawyer and legal activist, doing groundbreaking work on victims' rights and rape laws, was more highly valued. Until I went to college, I didn't know where my mother ended and I began a lack of differentiation more common in toddlers than teenagers. It was a problem my mother didn't recognize as such, which was, of course, part of the problem. 
Her life's purpose was to sacrifice and provide for me, and mine was to make her feel sufficiently loved in return. What could possibly go wrong?